Okay, uh, we'll move forward then to Dave. Yeah, and, and thank you very much, um, Mayor and Council, and assuming there's a lot of people watching at home. Um, I actually have two pieces of the update today. Uh, one is COVID, and I'll get to that in a minute. Um, I, I did want to touch base on the fact that this, uh, there is other things, there are other things going on. This is National Census Day. Um, and so certainly the census process has changed, but it is still going on. Um, and as you all know, uh, it's really important that the, the census process continue because it, it accesses uh, a lot of money for uh, cities and schools. Um, and so really encouraging all of our residents to, to complete the census online. Uh, it's available in 13 languages. Uh, you can go online and do that, and you can actually do it by telephone. Um, so encouraging our residents to do that, uh, it's super important. You can do it regardless of age, gender, citizenship, or immigration status. Uh, the the, the uh, census does not include questions about citizenship or immigration status to reassure the public. Um, it only has about nine questions and takes about 10 minutes to complete. And the entire process is confidential. So just encouraging the public to do that. Um, there's really about $675 billion in federal money at stake. And so we want to be able to access that money for our community. Um, so just want to make sure uh, we emphasize the importance of that. Um, all right, I'm going to move into the, the COVID update. Um, as I mentioned in our previous updates, uh, we are still very much in a race. Um, uh, a big part of what we're doing is, is keeping essential operations going um, during uh, the, this period um, and have big special efforts going on with regard to food distribution and providing emergency shelter. Um, and certainly, as you're all aware, yesterday um, we received updated public health orders that we're, we're going through the process of understanding and operationalizing, and you'll hear more about that in a few minutes. Um, I, I, I did wanna also highlight just some of the work that's going on um, that's maybe not front and center, um, and some of it a little bit behind the scenes, but um, really important work, um, highlighting some of the stuff that's been going on in planning, building, and code enforcement in particular with our inspection teams, I had to really, uh, reinvent the way room. we do inspections. Um, most of our inspections have been focused on residential inspection. Um, we actually have a, a small group of inspectors that come into uh, City Hall every day uh, that help with the dispatch of assignments and provide PPE uh, uh, to all of our staff and also uh, electronic devices. Um, We've been able to do about 50 video inspections um, that uh, uh, were done with our staff not having to go out to the site. Um, and as I mentioned, we do have about 10 staff that work in City Hall spread out uh, on the second and third floors, mostly in conference rooms, uh, to ensure that they're able to maintain uh, social distancing. Uh, some of you that have come to City Hall may have seen a bunch of city vehicles lined up on 6th Street every morning. Um, those are the cars of our inspectors that are, have been continuing to do the on-site inspections. We have about 25 inspectors that have been doing that. Um, they stay out in their cars um, on 6th Street um, and then they get their daily assignments and then they've been dispatched from, from 6th Street. I just will note though, with the new public health orders, we're, we'll be reevaluating kind of that and what we do there. Um, so just really um, appreciate uh, the willingness of our staff to change the way they do business and, and, and be creative and, and maintain service to uh, the development community. Um, also wanna highlight very much behind the scenes, but the tremendous effort that went on uh, for us to do payroll uh, last week. Um, 7,200 employees received uh, their direct deposit payments. Uh, tremendous amount of work with our finance staff and our IT staff and really timekeepers in each, each department making all of that happen. 
Uh, doing time cards during this, this time period has been is super complicated. Um, it can take a, a staff member, look, my, I don't normally do a time card, uh, but now I have to under the, uh, the rules in terms of uh, getting reimbursement through FEMA. And it took me uh, quite a while to do my time card. I can only imagine what it takes uh, other staff members to do theirs, but just um, a lot of appreciation for all of the work that went into making sure that happened. I have a lot of staff working remotely, kind of working through technology issues and, and, and sure enough, we did it. Um, so thanks to staff and IT and, and finance department. Um, uh, today, so we want to provide a little bit of uh, update on what's been going on. Um, as I mentioned last time, you know, we're uh, doing a lot to, uh, to deal with the, the health crisis. We all know we have a, an econ economic crisis globally, nationally, regionally, and, and also a, a fiscal crisis for our organization that we'll be spending more time with the council next week discussing. But in a second, Kip will get on and kind of provide you an overview of how we're thinking about all of that. And then uh, Lee will provide an update on kind of where we're at with our EOC operations. And so I'm going to ask Kip to jump on right now. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council and the public, Kip Harkness, Deputy City Manager. Um, Lee, if you could pu pull up the first slide. So um, as a reminder where we are in our fight against COVID-19 and how quickly things are changing, I wanted to walk through the timeline of the city of San Jose emergency response just very briefly. And as a point of comparison, note the number of confirmed cases in the United States at the time where key decisions were made. So 69 days ago on January 24th, we began activation, uh, active preparation, the same day that unbeknownst to us, the first case, or, case arrived in the United States from China. Uh, 31st of January, with an initial case in the county and seven in the, in the nation, we escalated to stage two and our initial response began with intensified planning and preparation City Hall. On the 26th of February, with the first evidence of community transmission in the county and 60 cases nationwide, we again escalated our response and formally activated the EOC. On the 5th of March, uh, with local numbers rising and 221 cases nationally, we began modification of service delivery and prepared to shift to closure of non-essential services. On the 15th of March, with over 3,600 cases nationally, we shifted to full emergency footing, shutting down all non-essential services and redirecting resources at scale to the response. Along the way, we have kept the mayor, city council, and public informed, including our presentation last week, uh, which highlighted the importance of the next two to three weeks in our response. As you can see, there were about 54,000 cases then, and then yes, as of yesterday, there are about 188,000 confirmed cases in the county, uh, excuse me, in the, in the nation at the time. You know, just for context, you can think of sort of the, the left-hand portion of the slide as sort of the chicken little uh, uh, portion where it might sound like uh, the sky is falling or that you might feel like you're overreacting. Um, but if you don't react then, by the time you get to the right-hand portion of the slide, it's often uh, too late to do what you need to do. But from the start, 69 days ago, we had a, a general sense of the epidemiology of this emerging disease and its potential. And we had wise counsel and direction of our public health official, Dr. Sarah Cody. We knew what might happen, so we were prepared for what we were projecting, not for what we were seeing. That, that brings us to today, and uh, advance to the next slide if you could, Lee. And I want to walk you through what we are now referring to as, as the three challenges of now. The city of San Jose is facing three concurrent challenges, public health, economic, and fiscal. The public health challenge is caused by, the, obviously, the rapid spread of COVID-19 and its manifestation from a pandemic to a local ap epidemic. The initial signs suggest that the public health orders we put into place are slowing and reducing the spread of the disease. However, the continuing epidemic still threatens our local health system and over with significant numbers of severe and critical cases over the next weeks and will require us to scale up support of our at-risk populations in particular. 
The economic challenge was precipitated by the public health measures of shelter in place. The ending of gatherings, non-essential work and travel, these necessary measures have brought an abrupt halt to a wide range of commercial activity. They have caused widespread and instantaneous unemployment and a massive drop in consumer spending. The fiscal challenge, in turn, was set in motion by this economic challenge. As the her first, the hotel and convention-related tax revenues began to dry up, then a whole range of payments and routine sources of revenue began to dramatically slow. This results in initial protections of budget deficits, both in the remaining months of this fiscal year and into next. Now, any one of those challenges on their own would rank as one of the more difficult events we've had to face as a city. Taken together, they are something of a perfect storm, the likes of which the city of San Jose has not seen in at least a generation and more. Each of the three challenges requires an immediate, robust, and effective response by city leadership, and each has a different imperative. We've outlined them here. The first imperative is that we save lives, and that is to address the public health challenge by slowing and reducing the spread of COVID-19 and the support of our most at-risk people. The second imperative is to save livelihoods, to face the economic challenge, supporting individuals, families, and businesses, especially small businesses, so they make it through the shelter in place order and are able to safely return to work as soon as possible. And the third imperative is preserving our fiscal health to face the fiscal challenge. Ensure the continued fiscal health of the city so we can meet imperative one and two while providing those essential services. We do not have the luxury of focusing on a single challenge and maximizing our response to suit its needs. We must optimize our response against all three. The need to optimize is forced by the competing and interconnected nature of our challenges. Some of the strategies best suited to effectively deal with one challenge will be at odds with the demands of another. To prepare for this triple challenge facing the city of San Jose, we must seek to understand the reality and likely progression of each challenge so that we can respond and where possible, actually shape the events to our advantage. The futures group of the Emergency Operations Center is preparing an initial situation assessment of these three challenges, looking at each individually and the interconnection between the three and the potential impacts and implications on San Jose as both a community and an organization. This situation assessment will be a combination of data, data modeling, internal subject matter expertise, and external reporting and analysis. The flow of the assessment will start with data in order to see patterns. From patterns, we will derive insights, and from insights, we will suggest potential actions. The intention is to present these insights and possible actions to key decision makers in the city, including the mayor and council, to debate, decide, and drive effective action based on sound assessment of the situation. In order to do that, we're kind of time box this analysis into three boxes. What do we need to do now over the next seven to 10 days, which will inform our emergency action plan? What do we need to do next in the next two to 12 weeks, which will inform um, our roadmap and the work that we do in the response? And what do we need to do later after the next 12 weeks and for the next year in order to be able to accommodate and meet all three of these challenges? So we will incorporate those into our planning efforts, we'll bring them back to you, and we will look together at all three of these challenges. Bottom line for today, our initial modeling that we shared last week suggested three insights and those insights hold. One is that the next two to three weeks continue to be critical for the response. We've seen a slow of the spread, but we are by no means out of the woods, and these next two to three weeks are absolutely critical. Two, ensuring continued compliance with the public health orders is absolutely vital to slowing and reducing the spread of the disease. And three, supporting those most at risk is crucial so all of us can make it through strong and healthy. Next slide, uh, please, Lee. So all of this is embodied in our roadmap through this epidemic, and it focuses the work now of the entire city on the vital few actions that will have the most impact. For the last week, Lee Wilcox, as director of the Emergency Operations Center, has been leading our response. I will now turn the presentation over to Lee to walk through some highlights of the last week of emergency operations. Lee. Thank you, Kip. Um, and as Kip mentioned, uh, the need for us not just to react to this disaster, but because the disaster or the, the crisis is unique, the importance of us planning continues to be important. Um, and this roadmap allows us to do that. We are able to plan, act, 
plan, act, and so and so. Equally as important, uh, given the three challenges that Kip just outlined for us, um, is our recovery process and what that looks like for our local economy and our community and our organization. And I'll touch upon that at the very end of the presentation. Um, I'm able, um, as EOC director last week, and and uh, speaking on him. Uh, on behalf of, of hundreds of people throughout the organization that have been helping on this response, kind of outline some of the highlights from the past week. And the first is related to compliance with the public health order. Um, this past week, the Emergency Operations Center, including the EPIO, our liaison branch, our Parks Department and Police Department, uh, generated a list of 16 possible actions for increasing our community's compliance with the public health order. And these actions were prioritized and scored uh, across four attributes um, with the team, and we've been able to implement several of those, um, which includes enforcement of it by our police department. Our police department has responded to a, just shy of 600 different locations in the city and issuing two citations. Under the leadership of Chief Garcia, he's deployed eight additional officers to our daytime shift and our swing shift to meet demands of these calls. In addition, PD is enforcing the Emergency Operations Center direction to close um, two park closures, the Alum Rock Park, as well as the Communications Hill Staircase. And our Police Department and Parks Department have continued to monitor other parks on the compliance and report back into the Emergency Operations Center. We've also developed public safety announcements in Spanish, Vietnamese, and Mandarin, as well as uh, a very tactical um, communication strategies around our parks, trails, and outdoor venues to ensure that the public understands the importance of the social distancing guidelines. And lastly, the team has started to use behavioral health insights um, and approach to create additional messages in English, Spanish, Vietnamese, and Mandarin. Um, and we'll be developing, is just finalizing developing a messaging toolkit that can be used by community influencers as well as the mayor, council, and appropriate city staff. Dave did an excellent job kind of highlighting um, things that are continuing to happen within the organization, but this past week, uh, the city manager did uh, approve the final continuity of operations plan, identifying and maintaining all essential services in the city. Most of that has happened without any interruption to our residents. And an informational memorandum was released last week detailing the different programs that were deemed essential and non-essential that continue to operate within the city. Third, support of our at-risk at communities and populations. I'll start with uh, our local assistance program. As we look at the three challenges ahead that Kip outlined, our community will need to return to normal as soon as possible, normal in quotations, obviously. Our residents, small businesses, and nonprofits will be vital for the return of our economy and our community connections to each other. This week, the EOC set up a task force um, within the liaison branch that focuses on our residents, our small businesses, and our nonprofits. On the residential front, this is focused on employment opportunities as well as communication to food and care programs. We've also completed a very robust work plan that's being implemented this week that focus on, focuses on additional components. For small business, the communications program has ramped up specifically yesterday around the county's new health order to ensure that small businesses in the city understand what the health order means to them, as well as offering small business assistance opportunities where needed. Much of last week and this week has been finalizing a more robust work program for our small businesses um, um, and its integration into SiliconValleyStrong.org. For our nonprofits, we've been uh, connecting to funding and resources where available, as well as job creation and job assistance for those who work in the nonprofit sector, and also developing a robust work plan and analyzing our existing city grants available, request existing grantees completion of our grant impact analysis so that we can make, make more informed recommendations on how to support our nonprofit sector. Uh, moving on to food distribution. Uh, the city has taken on the countywide role in necessities distribution for 1.9 million residents. As Deputy City Manager Angel Rios outlined last week, our approach has been to stabilize the current capacity in the program, to rapidly scale it, and third, 
uh, reiterate constantly to gain additional efficiencies. This past week, the city and its partners provided approximately 360,000 meals per day countywide and built additional partnerships and enhanced the program to increase this by more than 30%. The team is working aggressively to scale and build capacity to meet future needs through partnerships and support of our private sector and engaging additional private sector assistance and resources where appropriate. Moving on to our homeless assistance, in coordination with the county and the city, um, we've identified and produced an additional 818 beds for our unhoused population, including vulnerable individuals who need to be isolated and general shelter for individuals to thin our shelter and encampment population. This is a picture of the finished product of Parkside Hall, which is a general thinning, uh, a general shelter thinning strategy, and that opens today. The effort at Parkside Hall has been a tremendous one and has spanned the entire emergency operations center, including our operations department um, and our housing department, logistics and finance to all put in the proper resources, as well as work with the county on the services side to open this. And thank you to Jackie, her team and her leadership. <laughs> and then uh, this is a picture of the South Hall, which will open um, on Monday, and that is currently under construction and is available for additional shelter thinning as well. Uh, two weeks ago, the city took possession of 105 trailers uh, from the state, as previously noted. Um, these are located in the east park or the east parking lot of Happy Hollow Zoo. Um, while the, the, this is a fluid situation, one thing we do know right now that additional capacity will be needed. We're working with the county to better understand the use of these trailers, but we are currently standing them up and will be available next week. Uh, potential use includes a step down facility for the Santa Clara um, Convention Center step down facility um, for outpatient treatment, as well as general homeless population um, uh, shelter thinning, as well as homeless isolation and quarantine. And as we hammer those, detail down, those details down, we will report back to council on the use. Uh, the last in our current roadmap is our, our Powered by People section. And we can't do any of this without the people in this organization and this community. Um, and our logistics unit this week under the leadership of Matt Kano has procured and developed personal protective equipment for many of our um, uh, workers that are performing essential city, um, essential services, as well as for our community members who are volunteering. We've also explored a number of many uh, creative avenues to meet our current demand, given the limitations that we have for our PPE equipment. We are finalizing an in-house procedure for COVID testing for our own workforce, as well as standing up child uh, care facilities this past week for city workers who are um, doing essential services. Uh, general updates on this, the uh, zero to three year old um, uh, has a partnership with First Five and th those children have um, through First Five the ability to go to a licensed daycare facility. Opening yesterday um, was the Almaden Community Center for children at uh, that are between three and five and that is being run by our uh, parks and library department. And then opening yesterday, um, at our Willow Glen, Willow Glen Community Center was children six to 12, and that is also being run by our parks and library department. And then lastly, before I hand it over to Dave, I did want to speak about the recovery process. <clears throat> As I mentioned, typically um, recovery begins immediately following an event. Once an event happens, the EOC acts and we move quickly. And we uh, highlighted that last week when we integrated our planning approach. Um, this event really does require a different approach, specifically given the three challenges that Kip highlighted. So this past week, we've worked to better integrate our own business and administrative operations directly into the Emergency Operations Center. This has included our management, finance, <clears throat> and logistics section working with recovery to develop new standard operating procedures on our current spending priorities within the EOC and how those stack up against the city's budget overall. We've also stood up a robust group to guide and advocate for state and federal assistance 
helping ensure the city has access to the funding it needs to continue our COVID-19 response and recovery process. We've developed and implemented uh, trainings for EOC members as well as all the departments to better track their EOC or their uh, COVID-19 costs and agreements, ensuring we can maximize future FEMA reimbursement from the federal government. And lastly, we're using existing emergency management agreements um, to better engage FEMA experts into our own recovery process so that we can move quickly and efficiently through that process. And with that, I will hand it back over to Dave. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, Kip, and thank you, Lee. Um, I, I know the council and the public are seeing a lot of Kip and Lee and myself, but I just want to assure you that all of our city manager and, and department leaders are, are doing amazing work, as is our whole in, uh, organization. Many of our city staff have uh, been working through weekends and holidays. Um, I'm very proud of the organizational response. Um, very proud of the community response to um, all of the uh, changes that have been happening. Um, I, I think our partnership with the county, although sometimes uh, you know, the little pieces where we're out of sync get highlighted, what's, what really needs to be highlighted is the amount of work in, that we're doing with the county and how much of that work we are completely in sync on and, and just making a tremendous difference, I think. Also just want to acknowledge the work that all the nonprofits are doing um, in partnership with us. We couldn't do it without them. And, and all, also, you know, how private industry is stepping up and, and contributing. So uh, that completes our report. And uh, Kip and Lee and myself are available for any questions.